let me change the tone of the, the questions here. And I'm curious about, um, given the veritable explosion of what is now broadly available through recordings to those interested in any area of music, including early music, choral music, and so on, what do you see as a meaningful role for amateur performing groups like ours, like the Calgary Renaissance singers? Well, I think they're absolutely crucial. Um, partly because amateur groups with a, with a, with a defined local um, ca catchment, as it were, have the privilege of being in touch with their public very closely. Uh, we, we don't have that privilege quite so well to hear what people think of us and what we what they think of the music and how well we've done it we tend to have to rely on professional critics in newspapers who always have an axe to grind always want to um never quite say what and, and may not represent anybody else's opinion anyway so i i it's the importance of local groups is that they encourage people to sing the music and to enjoy it to learn how to enjoy it um, obviously, you need to do it as well as you possibly can. You need, you always need to come off stage. You know, don't, don't sort of, don't say, oh, I didn't do, I didn't do it well. I, I made a mistake. Or, I, I've heard amateurs get terribly caught up in the mistakes they make. Just get an overview. The professionals never bother, never really care about mistakes. But they come off stage saying that was fantastic. You know, even if they made two or three slips. Um, it doesn't weigh them down. Uh, just, just forget about the errors, really, and enjoy the, the quality of the performance that you can that you can do collectively. Um, and then, if you're enjoying it, the public will enjoy it. If if they can see you're enjoying it, rather than looking you know, terrified that you've just made a slip. Um, if they, the public can join you smiling at, at yourselves or at each other and the, the conductor with a bit of luck, um, the public will enjoy it too. And then, of course, they start to listen to the music as music or something that doesn't, that, that isn't a, just a horrible test of stamina or something that they've got to live through. And everyone gets, a, gets something extra in their lives from this music. Um, we're, we're, I, I, I miss that contact with, with people who, well, we do have some that come in luck to London, but you know, London's already a huge number of people swimming around. And I think you're in a very fortunate position. And I mean, that you, you've survived 50 years. That's an incredible achievement. It is, it is definitely an accomplishment. And I know, for instance, among some of our members, uh, there are those who'd be very happy just simply singing the music uh, and never giving a performance. But I think that uh, all our directors have said there's a reason for doing a performance because that pushes you to a certain level. Yes, I think, I think that must be true. If you don't stand and deliver, I mean, you can do it for fun around the kitchen table. That's a different business, really. Yes. Um, now you've got to give concerts and people have got to pay to come and hear you. You know, you've got to be worth it. You, you've got to keep up your standards, whatever it takes. I mean, in the telescopes, it's me looking unhappy if, if, if I don't get what I want. Um, but, but you can relax. You can do it in a more relaxed way. And clearly you have done because, you know, it's lasted a long time. But do, I mean, do you, what do you do about repertoire? Do you, we, is it, you know, we stick to what we do, but but do you do a bit of everything? Do you, do you sing Britain and? Uh, we don't do a huge amount of uh, modern composers, uh, and those that we do do tend to be, as you've suggested, composers that, in their style, have a certain link to uh, a Renaissance mentality about the the music that they produce. Um, yeah. In in other repertoire. Uh, it's it's definitely anchored in, in, in the Renaissance, but obviously both sacred and secular, uh, there is no doubt that audiences uh, would probably find uh, a concert entirely devoted to sacred music, and many of our members would love that. 
but an audience would probably find it just a little bit difficult to do. Um, but, we, you, but you put us on, to, that's what you ask us to do. Yes, yes, yes. Um, should I say that uh, you do do it at a better, higher level than we do? Uh, but, but yes. Um, and we also actually do uh, mixed performances, so we will have things like readings from the time. Oh. So the, the, there's a mixed element to the kind of concert that we do. Um, mm. We do change up the repertoire um, in the sense that uh, we do introduce new pieces that nobody in the choir has ever done. We have one member who simply says, if we haven't done a piece for three years, it might as well be a new piece because everybody's learning it again. So <laughs> we can recycle, uh, but there are definitely favorites which come back uh, again and again. Well, then it's a question of what the public want, will turn out to hear. I mean, you don't want to lose your public. That's certainly true. And I would say that the, the public is coming out partially to hear things that they think they have heard before and know and that they like, and then maybe encounter something that they haven't heard before, but that might become a new favorite and so on. So uh, it's, it's uh, the audiences, I think, come out um, in anticipation rather than knowing what they will exactly what they'll get. And I think, well, that's, that's healthy. That, that gives you... Know. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're in January of a new year, after one in which almost all artistic activity has been disrupted. So I'm going to ask some Janus-like questions looking back and forward. So is there a personal highlight or a favorite piece among your recordings that you have? That's a terribly difficult one to answer. Um, you all our children equally but differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it, it's easy for me, actually, when I get on stage and I've chosen the programme of, let's say it's got seven or eight different pieces in it, and I'm looking forward to doing each one, and I've chosen them from that point of view that I know we'll sing them well, and I know I want to do them, and I know the singers want to do them too. So... So there are a lot of favorites, to be honest. Um, Gaudi Gloriosa, I keep referring to it, is one of them, but we can't do it very often. But I, I'm glad I've chosen it for this interview. Um, Josquin has been, or was meant to be this, this coming year, I mean, it remains to be seen what's, what's left of it. Um, but this is his 500th anniversary of his death. And, you know, for, for a fanatic like me, this is a fantastic anniversary. Here's the greatest composer of his, of his period altogether. And he's 500 years, this is 500 years. We know when he died on August the 27th. Um, if it all goes pear-shaped, I should be gutted. Well, I won't get another chance. I mean, there won't be another chance for Josquin. Yes. Yes. Mm. Anyway, um, and I've got to love him. I mean, he's a difficult composer and he, I suspect that not many of your listeners will know very much by him, actually. Um, um, I was thinking in terms of our repertoire, one piece that we have done is the Ave Maria. That's uh, well, we, well, we recorded that, um, as we've discussed. Uh, that's also a very old recording, actually. Yeah. But let's, let's, let's play it. <laughs> I certainly intend to. Can you do that? Yes, yeah. we'll be playing it, yes. Um, well, this is a classic. Let me introduce this one a bit. Uh, it's a classic piece, um, four parts only. Josquin tended to write in five and six parts, but um, not in his secular music so much, and and not in his masses. His masses, are, which we've been concentrating on, we've made a com for this anniversary year. We've made a, we've recorded all his masses, the eight, eighteen masses. They're all available. The last one's just come out. Um, it's nine discs of, and it's 18 masses. So there we are. Look out for it. Um, it's been a tremendous project to do. Um, and what I was saying was that, that those masses are all, pretty well all of, all of them are in four parts. You, you can't call it soprano, alto, tenor, bass, I'm afraid. That hadn't sort of shaped up in his time. It's not really a soprano part. 
it's a problem for modern choirs. And that's one of the reasons why he's not very well known. Mm. Um, but this but this Ave Maria does have a soprano part. But, well, you need to transpose it up a bit, but we all do. And then it does come as I say T B. So we all do it. And it's it's the most sort of transparent music. It's the light sort of shines through it. It's the textures are incredibly simple. You remember the opening, the way it just has this very honestly imitation at the most basic level. And yet it sounds a million dollars. I don't you know, it's one of those that's genius. I, I, and then it goes on like that. <laughs> and it ends so well. It's just a beautiful ending. Um, very still. But very difficult to do, actually, without either overloading it and making it a bit saccharine, or um, not singing it sort of statuesquely enough, let's say not in tune, so it sort of doesn't sound very good. They're quite long chords that you have to sustain. Quite difficult. It is not an easy piece, I'll certainly vouch for No, that. it isn't. Well, you see, and yet it's one of his easier pieces, actually. I, I know Sorry. that. Um, but what I will say about it is one of the most transparent Renaissance pieces in that as you are singing it, even if you sort of, you know, have to concentrate on your own part, uh, you really can see the structure of it as you sing it. There aren't that many pieces certainly not for amateur singers, uh, mm. where you can do that. No, that's true. And the ranges are more or less sympathetic. The, so I remember the two middle parts sort of fall over each other a bit, so the tenors are singing very high and the altos are singing very low. That's not a great thing for, for anyone to have to realise. Unless, unless you mix them. Have you altos. mix them, yes, certainly. Altos and tenors. There are editions, not least by Anthony Petty, actually, <laughs> where he swaps the parts around without permission from Josquin. With an asterisk to say he's doing it. Yes, I know. <laughs> 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 well, fair enough. I mean, it makes it performable. And then, you know, just to go off on an academic tangent for a second, do you, you know Bird's four-part mass? You must all know Bird's four-part yeah. mass? Yes. That's what happens with the middle parts in that piece. Where did he get that from? Because it doesn't happen in the five-part mass, or indeed in pretty well anything else I can think of by Bird. But in that piece, the two middle parts are falling over each other as if they're basically the same range. I wonder whether he got it from Josquin. Yeah, it's an interesting theory, that. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>
Is there still a composer or a piece that it is your burning ambition to perform and or record? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. Uh, an awful lot. <laughs> because the problem is, I mean, it's not a problem, it's, it's a richness, but um, the Renaissance period is relatively unexplored. And one can say with some confidence that, that there are still not only master, masterpieces by great composers to record and get to know, Palestrina immediately comes to mind, or Lassus, but there are also composers you've never heard of yet, who have just got lost in history by some mischance. Like in Victoria's case, um, he's all right now, but for a hundred years ago, there was no proper edition of Victoria, whereas there was an edition of Palestrina and Lassus. And so Victoria got left behind. The same happened to Shepherd. And then there are many uh, lesser examples. We don't know how, how good or bad they were because they've, they've got lost. There's a, there's a German composer called Ludwig Deser who bumped into Lassus at just the wrong moment in his career and vanished. And he continues to write music and we're beginning to find it. And it looks fantastic on the page. But um, unfortunately for him, he, he was eliminated from history by Lassus. He didn't, Lassus didn't mean to do this. He just was great. And days of bump into him. Anyway. Um, so, so there's all that. There's the, and whereas you see in the Baroque period, I, I, I don't get the impression there's a great composer still to be discovered in the Baroque era. There may be one or two good pieces to discover, but I, it's not the same scene at all. No, although some came later than others, I, I, I think. For example, yes, Vivaldi. Uh, well, but Zelenka is one that, that oh, uh, yes, to me. Yes, indeed, yes. Well, yes. Came into his own fairly recently. Yes. Yeah, that's true. He, he's sort of on the cusp, isn't he, between Renaissance and Baroque. And there are quite a few of those, I think. I, I would say he was early Baroque, but certainly even I uh, had a lot of admiration for him and studied his works. He was being performed in Oxford when I was an undergraduate. Ah, there you go. And it's sort of double and triple choir music, which, yeah. well, anyway. It varies, it varies a great deal. There's a lot. But I don't think we're going to find another Handel or, or, or even Corelli or, you know, I mean, they've all been unearthed and explored, and a lot of them have been found rather, to be rather dull, like Telemann. Uh, I think Telemann still has... Uh... <laughs> has life in him. I, I think they, right. the key to Telemann has perhaps not been entirely discovered. All right, no, that, maybe that's, I, I'd like to think that. Yes, okay. No. Um, how about, but to come no, back. Hang on, I haven't, I haven't given you an answer, which I'm very happy to That's do. what I was coming to. Oh, good. Um, well, there are, there are two sort of areas of answer. One is that I want to do more of the Eton Choir book. I don't know whether that means anything to you, but it's, um, I won't go into the history of it, but it was a fantastic anthology of music written in England around the year 1500. So it's pre-Taverner, old Taverner, yeah. uh, and, and involves the music of Fairfax Brown. John Brown is the pick. You've, you've done a disc of Brown, though. Yeah, we have. Actually, I mean, if I was to, yeah, I, I, I wish I was playing you some Brown, because, but he's very long-winded again. Um, but he's just, he's got, a, he's got an atmosphere to him, a, a, a mystical atmosphere that's just beautiful. He, he's one of, I am going to go out there one of these days and say that he's one of the five greatest composers to come from England. I don't think I'd quibble with well, no one would know that I was right, wrong or right. <laughs> but I do believe it. Yes. John Brown, not a very um, hopeful name, but resonant name but very resonant music indeed He's, he wrote the first piece in the Eton choir book he was obviously reckoned to be the, the best at the time and he wrote an eight part piece eight parts is very very rare almost unique um and it's the first piece in the choir book and then there are some more pieces by him in the choir book but there are great i mean it's it's not properly explored the Eton choir book it, it's so difficult the music is really hard yes yeah 
second one. The, uh, yeah, the other area really are these Flemish composers that were Josquin's contemporaries or pupils, but Heinrich Isaac, I think is, has been unfairly, he's not neglected, but he's just not put on the same pedestal as Josquin. Um, and I think he's not, not, not every bit as good, but he's, he's got a completely different style. We need to put those two styles together and, and see what they come to. And he wrote a lot. So there's, there's, there is some very great music by Isaac. Well, I look forward to... Well, so do I. If I live long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question completely out of left field. What does Peter Phillips listen to when he's not preparing pieces for uh, any of his choirs? Yes. Well, I, I thought about this. I mean... The, the honest answer to that is that music is work for me. I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful work. But if I want to relax, I watch films. I'm a cineast. Very serious. No, no, Very no, no, no. I, 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 I mean, that, that has emerged in, in the course of this conversation. Um, so perhaps then I should ask you to give us some of your favourite films of all time. Oh, well, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, people say, you know, what shall we watch? And I say, well, I've got at least 1,600 films upstairs on DVD. I collect DVDs because I then take them around the world with me, you know, in my, with my laptop, and I watch them in hotel rooms. That's what I, that's what I do to relax. Um, and, you know, is it going to be Japanese? Or, or I love the Japanese school. And actually, all right, well, I mean, one... A director, his name is Ozu, O-Z-U, O-Z-U. Uh, he was one of these people who liked to edit things to within an inch of its life. And uh, I, I love the results. Apparently he would film someone putting a cup down on a saucer 20 times until they were, they were so fed up with this. <laughs> But he, they wouldn't do it anymore. But, but he had one take that was the perfect one. And he would then spend months finding the perfect take. Now, that is, that is obsessive, I suppose. I mean, we can't live in that world. But a kindred spirit. Yeah, it, it is really. And I, the, the, truth, the, the proof of the pudding is that I love the results. Um, they are beautiful films. And there's, there's so much atmosphere in them that you would have thought would have been driven out by this editing process. Not at all. And he's using really great actors, and I'm using really great singers, you know. I actually do see quite an equivalence. Yes. Um, but let me just, just to be more sympathetic slightly, um, I do have areas of music that I, that I like. Um, Bruckner's symphonies, Bruckner and Mahler and Strauss, a bit of Wagner. And then piano music by Chopin and Schubert and Beethoven. Those are the well, the discs I've got in the car when I can't watch a film and I'm driving, I'll, I'll put on, I often put on Schubert. There's something perfect about Schubert. But it's the piano, you see. I mean, there's the piano. It's, a, it's, a, it's got one sound. And Bren, it's Brendel is my, is my favourite piano. So he, he plays Beethoven, then he plays Schubert, then he plays, I don't know, something else. And the piano sounds the same. It's the same instrument. And he's not making that much difference between these repertoires. And in answer to a previous question, I think that justifies us as well, or explains us. Let's assume, as we all hope, that COVID retreats, if not disappears, uh, what do you see in the future for Peter Phillips and the Palace Scholars? Well, the moment we're free to do it, we're going to leap back onto the track and, and start rushing around again. Um, I mean, this last year, it's nearly a year now, um, it's 10 months, has been unique since I was a schoolboy. I mean, we started traveling, well, when I left Oxford, we started traveling almost immediately after that. I started the Palace Scholars when I was at Oxford. And I've, I've hardly been at home in early December 
for, for nearly 50 years. And then suddenly, every day, I'm sitting at home, which I've rather enjoyed. Well, well, to be well, honest, it's, it's, it's led to a slightly intellectually a, a broader life because um, when you're traveling, the, the travel uses up all your energy. And you've got, if you've got a concert at the end of the day, you've got no energy left by the end of it all. It's really arduous. Um, and, but, but all that has gone out of my day and I've, I've had time to think and write. I've been writing quite a lot about Shoskan and Talis. I've been writing about Talis. Thinking about those sorts of things at greater leisure and cooking. It's been a nice time, but I, uh, the, the money situation is disastrous, so it's got to end. And, and anyway, I, I just can't wait to, I, I can't wait to give a concert. Well, it seems... Not, I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, we get back on the trail and, and every day we're sort of, we're taking concerts in or postponements from this year or last year that are taking in and then they get cancelled again. There's a concert in Gdansk in Poland which we were now on the third iteration of trying to book this concert because it was last Easter. Now it's gone for this Easter. Now we're trying to fix it for next Easter. Yes. And so it goes on. And we're just trying to hold the singers, you know, get, keep the singers motivated and, and say it's going to happen when it, you know. but nobody knows. Uh, we're hoping that by June, we might be able to at least sing to. Um, but they may still be small, small crowds, and the problem with small crowds is that the promoter then has a financial problem themselves because they're not taking in the ticket revenue they need to take in. But we just see how it unravels. But so um, off we go, and what happens in the long term is that the is that the vision that I came up with when I was an undergraduate with the sound and the determination to proselytize this music, whoever would take it anywhere in the world, uh, to, to excite an interest in it, keep going. You know, we've, we've started off in China now. It's an exciting place to do it because they look at it very differently and I'm fascinated by how they hear it, um, what sort of music they go for from us, whether they like the sound, we're going to make a documentary about, that's one thing we are going to do in the near future, is make a documentary about how the music is received by different people, peoples around the world. Um, and for me personally, I just, I just need to keep fit enough to, you know, to keep doing, being able to go around the track, because I am now much older than everybody else. I have to say that the uh, documentary idea strikes me as being one of the more interesting things that may come out of this very long experience uh, that you are able to provide. Um, the, because uh, you're, it has opened up parts of the world to you that would not necessarily have opened up to a short and lived group. Um, and uh, there's a longevity in there that translates into something interesting and i think useful i think it's i hope i think it's extremely useful i mean you know what i'm trying to do is put this music on the same level as a beethoven symphony uh, in the public mind how do you do that uh, beethoven's you know been worshipped ever since he he was around it's more difficult but it's done by maintaining the highest standards and being not not getting way not getting bogged down by fads or local difficulties, just power through and, and keep the basic vision, uh, which is based in, in discipline and, and love of the, of the music. Well, that seems to me like a very appropriate um, moment on which to conclude uh, our interview. And uh, on behalf of the Calgary Renaissance Singers and Players, I would like to thank you, Peter, for having agreed to do this interview for having shared your insights and perspectives, uh, controversial though some of them may be, but uh, always challenging. And may I wish us all, professionals and amateurs alike, uh, return to singing together as soon as it is safe to do so. Uh, I know that we all feel that need most keenly. So 
Thank you again. Thank you very much. And I wish you the best for your 51st year. Thank you. And more.